white blood cells are predominantly involved in fighting infections and participating in inflammatory reactions, while red blood cells carry oxygen to the body platelets. Help stop bleeding. The normal number of white blood cell ranges from around 4 to 11 million cells per liter. Newborn babies have a higher range from around 9 to 30 billion cells per liter, which goes down over the first two years of life and is similar to adult normal ranges for the rest of childhood opposed to red blood cells. The normal range is not affected by gender. However, it is affected by race in national studies. African Americans have lower baseline white blood cell counts than Caucasians. There are several different ways to categorize white blood cell disorders. First, they could be categorized by cause those that affect white blood cell production and other factors that affect the function of the white blood cell. Secondly, white blood cell disorders might be categorized by which type of white blood cell is affected in some disorders. All the white blood cells are affected, but others only affect one type. There are five major types of white blood cells neutrophils, which predominantly fight bacterial infections lymphocytes, which predominantly fight infections, monocytes, which predominantly fight fungal infections, eosinophils, which predominantly fight parasitic infections and are involved in allergic reactions and basophils which are involved in inflammatory reactions. Thirdly, white blood cell disorders can be classified as benign or malignant. The majority of white blood cell disorders are benign. Generally too much of one type of white blood cell is suffixed with philia on the end of the word and too few of one type of white blood cell is suffixed with pina, which is applicable to all types of white blood cells. For instance, leuka. Philia is a white blood cell count above the normal range and leukopnea is a white blood cell count below the normal range. These can also be applied. Scientific white blood cells such as neutropenia with too few neutrophils or basophilia with too many basophils. Leukophilia is an increased number of white blood cells. The most common causes are infection medications. Like prednisone autoimmune, neutropenia occurs when the body secretes antibodies that attack and destroy neutrophils. Patients with severe congenital neutropenia are born with severe neutropenia secondary to genetic mutation and have recurrent bacterial infections cyclic. Neutropenia is caused due to genetic mutation, similar to severe congenital neutropenia. However, the neutropenia does not occur every day, but in cycles of about 21 days. Leukemia is a cancer. Cancerous white blood cells produced in the bone marrow. Chronic granulomatous disease is a disorder where multiple types of white blood cells become unable to function properly. It is an inherited condition and results in multiple infections, particularly pneumonia and abscesses. Leukocyte adhesion deficiency is a disorder where the white blood cells are unable to move areas of infection. Mu next topic today is concussion. So, what's the aim of these new guidelines? Well, the aim is really to provide a resource and not for the top level, professional sports people, but for parents, teachers and coaches of young people playing sport, the guidelines basically offer some expert information from a GP in emergency. Vision and myself as a neurosurgeon about what the condition is also, how to identify the symptoms and how to manage it. If any of your listeners have ever had a concussion doing sports, you'll know how frightening it can be. It's confusing and painful and difficult sometimes for teachers, parents or whoever to work out if someone with concussion is okay. I mean, we hope to remedy that MMM. And how do we know when someone is suffering from concussion? Well, obviously if the person's actually knocked out it's clear but not all patients actually lose consciousness. Often following a hard knock to the head, they become disorientated or experience headaches nausea or vomiting. These are signs of concussion and they made clear initially, but then return, when the individual actually undertakes further physical activity, where they start to train say so it can actually take quite a while for things to really clear up. The essence of it is that, people shouldn't start playing again until those warning signs have completely subsided. Yes. 
and you say that waiting anything less than 14 days after all the symptoms have cleared would be too early to return if that's right. If they go back too early, they risk a second concussion. And as we know from professional athletes, they may have to give up their sport if they have too many concussions, so, it's better. Particularly in a young person with a developing brain to allow all of the symptoms to settle and only then return to play well, usually return to train first, then return to play after that. He used to be thought that receiving another concussion could lead to severe brain swelling, and that could be fatal or at least involve a visit to the emergency room. I think the evidence is fairly slim for that. What we do know though, is that the compounding effect of having one concussion followed by another seems to be more severe than just the one so it's always better to let the brain recover fully before playing again. Right? So who's at the highest risk of sports concussion? Well, actually a concussion can happen whenever anyone receives a blow to the head. Usually it's a sort of twisting blow, not a straight on blow. But obviously people playing sports like rugby where there's bodily contact stand, more chance of being at the receiving end of such a blow. But having said that, it's just as likely to affect kids, kicking a ball around a park, as it is to affect top professional players in big matches. Do you think that youth sports need specialist concussion? Doctors on hand, like the professionals do. There's always a risk, and we know that it happens from time to time, but, I mean, most games, even those dangerous ones are without incident at all. I think people are involved in running youth whether they be referees, coaches or parents can be made aware of how to manage concussion, the signs that they need to look out for and maybe the warnings of something more serious. So that they can take the appropriate actions, but I think always having a doctor on the sidelines, where young people are playing, is just an overreaction, right? In the USA college football is big business. The trialing helmet, sensors, and impact sensors teaching that's something we need everywhere. Well, I don't think it'll come to that. I think there are two scenarios, here. The first is one where a concussion's a one-off event following a significant blow to the head, right? The second's quite different and involves chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This comes about particularly in American football where players use their helmets and heads almost like weapons. That type of repeated impact seems to add up over the player's career that's something we've heard being discussed mostly. USA naturally, there's interest generally in protecting players, particularly in the professional levels of sport, but I see that as a different matter.